come to the last session of this conference. And the first speaker today morning is Dr. Lenny Smith from LSC and Oxford. His talk is about model error and data assimilation. All the groups that invited us to come down, uh, it's been a very Uh, two different things today. So model error, well, so data simulation, of course, but the role model error plays in data simulation. So I'll, I'll, as I'll say a couple of times, nope. You know, data, most of the time when we think about data simulation, we think about data simulation in the context where we, we treat the model error as small. Right? or even non-existent, or perfectly known. So model error, which is just IID displacements in the state space, that's not really model error. That's just a stochastic system. So what role does model error play? And then I also want to show uh, a bit on what we actually see in operational systems, what this, the importance this is going to have. So first of all, identifying the aims of, of data simulation when the, ideally before designing the data simulation system. Uh, there, there are several, three different kinds of imperfections in the forecast model that I'd like to talk about. The first is just drift due to model error. The fact that if we have an ensemble of initial conditions in our model that are going off one direction, reality will tend to go off in some other direction just because the flow that we have isn't actually the flow that, the, the flow that we're simulating isn't actually the flow that we want. The second one is testing various mathematical assumptions we make. So if we make the common filter or when we look at things like singular vectors, we, we pretty much assume time scales on which the flow is linear. So we can actually test to see whether or not those time scales are true. And the third one is this is a question of how we initialize ensembles. So for me, the aim of data simulation is an ensemble of initial conditions, right? So we can either find a point, you know, it's possible to just find one trajectory and then from that trajectory deduce another ensemble. But really the data simulation aspect should give us the ensemble we really want to have. Okay, and then I'll talk a little bit about gradient descent assimilation, uh, like Emma did. And then the, the, the sort of take home things. One of the advantages of gradient descent is to say that we can look at a really long window I mean, days, weeks, right? And the, the, the point is by looking at longer windows to assimilate data, you very often get some of the larger scale structures in the atmosphere that are hard to pick up out of many short term localized assimilation schemes. So I'll show you an example of how that actually works with no gaps. And secondly, <clears throat> is the issue of, you know, I, I don't know what my model error is. If I do, I would fix the model. So. Another aspect of a good data simulation scheme is it should tell you something both about the observational noise, if it can separate that out, but it should actually give you as an output something about the model error. So that, that's, where I, that's where I'm headed. I'd also, I won't have time to actually talk about the question of how do you tell if you have a good data simulation scheme? So I mean, how do you actually tell if you have a good data simulation scheme? I mean, one aspect is it runs and you can generate forecasts. But you know, what, what are really interesting ways of comparing those? And I'd love to talk about those later today or next week. So when the model's perfect, life is easy, right? The target, the state, there is a state out there which is true. And the, that target is the same for now casting, for forecasting, for forecasting at any lead time, no matter how far you go into the future. Nonlinearities mean that we can't actually have a nice analytic description of what that ensemble is going to look like. But we still take a, a sample, right? So I'll just call that sample an ensemble. And this is sort of the, the picture of what we would like to have, right? Th this, is, this is the output. Th this is an example from the Lorenz equations. So this is the value x in the Lorenz equations, which corresponds to the speed of the flow. This is time moving into the future. And this is the evolution of a probability density as we move forward in time. So that probability density tells us pretty much all we can know about the future of the flow, given the uncertainty in the initial conditions that started. So I mean, it actually does fairly interesting things. At first, it, it moves and spreads out. The PDF gets wider. 
If it gets tighter again, of course this could only happen in nonlinear systems, it's easier to forecast this system out here at 0.4 seconds than it is at 0.2 seconds. It moves around and bifurcates, right? So you, you have some probability this is being over on one wing, this is being on the other wing. So we spend a lot of time worrying about how to get, how to do data simulation to provide this kind of probability forecast. And the aims here are to find an accountable forecast, the forecast that only suffers from the fact that we only have a finite sample. So you can do this in a Bayesian way, and the formulation works perfectly, it's just impossibly hard to do. And effectively, we find an important sampler that allows us to move forward. The problem is that we can only do this when the model is perfect. As soon as the model is imperfect, we just sort of, I think we have to let go of this idea that this target exists out there for us to aim at. So once the model is imperfect, then the data simulation scheme actually needs to reflect the aims for assimilating the data in the first place. If you're trying to get a model state that's the best description of the current state of the atmosphere, a now pass, that aim is different from trying to find an ensemble which will give you a good eight-day forecast. And this needs to be recognized when we're actually building the ensemble the assimilation scheme. In fact, it can even be different for different forecasts. So, well, is this really a problem? I mean, if our models were almost perfect, then perhaps it isn't going to bother us. Well, it doesn't bother us in the dynamical sense that even if we have small difference between the flow we're trying to simulate and the flow of our model, so I'll generally call one the system, the thing we're trying to simulate, which may not even be a flow, of course, and the other is our model. As long as those, small, as long as those differences are small, we, we may still have shadowing trajectories that we could try to, I, I, try to identify in our data simulation scheme. Trajectories which actually stay very close in the future or in the past to the data. But even if we have only small differences in the flow, we can have huge differences in the manifold on which the flow lives. Right? And this will have a big impact on trying to do things like ensemble forecasts. Also, to some extent, this, there's an escape clause here. Large, large problems in the flow, large systematic errors in the model can't be fixed by better data assimilation. <clears throat> so what's the first imperfection? Well, the first one is drift. So let's suppose we just start with a ball of initial conditions. This is, this is a ball of initial conditions in the perfect model case. This is a ball of initial conditions where the model isn't perfect. And we just, this is actually just a two-dimensional ball in a three-dimensional space, but you can think of it fairly generally. As we go forward in time, the top one distorts itself into some kind of ellipse, right? But the imperfect model not only distorts, but it also starts to drift away. And we'll call this motion, right? Say the center of mass of this entire sphere. We'll call this motion away from the actual target. So this is the target moving forward in time. Right? You can think of this as the un an entire ensemble drifting away in time. There's no way data simulation can help you fight this drift if it's large. So this is showing the same thing again. If we just look at, the, if we just look at a spherical shell bounding this region, Right, they're all, they're all the points start out with the surrounding truth, right? So this is a, you know, we basically put our ensemble on top of truth to illustrate. Initially, all the, air, all, the, all the points have a certain distance, a certain error from truth. And as we go forward in time, this line corresponds to this picture, right? We continue to capture truth, and the error is just spread out. Because the system's chaotic, eventually these points will rise up. But because we actually have a bounding surface, right, truth can't get out. Right? We'll always have points relatively near truth. On the other hand, when the entire ensemble drifts away, right, then all the points drift away. So this is, this is why I keep asking this question, what, what, what is the aim of data simulation in that case? And that's the drift, right? That's the drift that I'm going to be talking about in the next slide. So is this a problem? Well, this is a problem. This is a result from ECMWF, from the model that was operational in 2000. And what we've done is we've looked at these drift vectors, right? The, the, the direction in which the ensemble goes versus where the, anal the next analysis is going to be. So that's just, that's just a, a vector in a million dimensional space. We look at these every day for a few hundred days, 
And then, for instance, we look at them on consecutive days. We look at the angle between today's drift vector and tomorrow's drift vector. So this is the distribution of those consecutive days, the cosine of the angle between them. And this is the distribution just taking days at random. And the point is that even on 24-hour, 48-hour time scales, this model error has a systematic component, right? which moves around, but it's coherent in time. So if you wanted to treat model error, right, you see, what you, what you, what you need to see is only that, right, there, there's, a, there's a bump here just less than 0.1, whereas here most of the points are just picking randomly oriented drift vectors, the maximum is much less than 0.05. So what does that mean? That means today's model error shares more in common with tomorrow's model error than just randomly chosen pieces of model error. So what does that mean? Well, that means if I want to describe, if I want to actually put into my data assimilation scheme something about model error, I can't just do it with IID samples. Right? I need to actually get the state dependence of the model error, because that state dependence is going to persist for several days. And the drift is large, right? even at global scales. So these are results from HADGEM2 for global mean temperatures, thanks to Emma. Um, for making the graph after not for running HADGEM2. So what, what you can see is that th these, are, these are ensembles of three points started, uh, at very, started every 10 years or five years. And the point is that initially, all these points warm much more than the sort of variations you see in the global mean temperature. You can also see it fairly easily in seasonal models. So these are models from, uh, from ensembles. So these are several different seasonal models. Here we have the systematic error. This is, the, this is even just averaging over all initial conditions. We have systematic errors in the Nino 3.4 uh, SSTs, which are on the order of a degree or two, a degree or so. Right. Now the entire oscillation is only on the order of three or four degrees. So we have, we have model errors, in this case even systematic model errors, which within a, within a short time compared to the forecast are, are quite large. The second question is one of appropriateness. We're very often making linear approximations. Right? And the question then comes, is the linear approximation an appropriate approximation to make? Well, a way to test that, when we're forming ensemble, when operational ensembles very often make plus and minus perturbations about the control, if we actually see where those perturbations go. If we add these two vectors together, as long as things are linear, they'll cancel each other out and give us something of zero length. As the flow becomes nonlinear, then we'll actually get some other vector. The sum of the two will begin to grow. And what we can look at in the operational models is how fast does that nonlinearity get large? So what we're doing is we add the two vectors together, and then we divide by their average, their average length. So we'll get a number between 0 and 2. If the number is 0, the two are anti-parallel. If they've actually flipped over and they're pointing in the same direction, there'll be 2. And what we see is the ECMWF ensemble is nonlinear at 48 hours. It's actually pretty nonlinear even within 24 hours. Right? This is important if you're, using a, if you're using a filter that's assuming linearity on those sorts of time scales. And of course, in this case, ECMWF was using singular vectors defined over 48 hours. But the system wasn't linear over 48 hours. So it's just important to test the time scales on which common filters and, S and singular value decompositions are being used and making sure that the actual flow as you in and realize it with the observational uncertainties that are actually there still respect that linearity. And the last point is a question of starting things off the model. So off the model manifold. So this is an idea, supposed to be an idea like a racetrack corner of the Lorenz 63 attractor. If we start initial conditions close to the manifold, they stay close to the manifold. If we start initial conditions far from the manifold, they fall down onto the manifold fairly quickly. So if you're making one forecast for your data simulation scheme, that's probably OK, right? maybe even desirable. But if you're starting a large ensemble, then you're sampling a three-dimensional space in this case. And you're very quickly, that's going to collapse down onto a two-dimensional manifold. So you have a very, very inefficient sampling scheme. You're, you're, you're in an operational model, right? Your perturbations may be sampling a 10 to the 6th dimensional space, 
but then very quickly they get squashed down onto the model manifold, even if it's wrong. So you waste, you're, you're, you're doing a much harder sampling problem than you need to do if you could actually choose conditions on the manifold. So just to give you an idea, this is the sort of idea of what happens with just one point. If we start on the manifold, it just moves on the manifold. If we start off the manifold, it sort of comes over and falls down. There may be an advantage of this if it's more realistic. Like this, this guy will look better at time one, time zero. But if we're actually starting an ensemble, to sample this lower dimensional manifold is much more efficient than putting points in the entire state space. So what should we aim for? Well, again, the picture I showed at the beginning for Lorentz is trying to find something like this. This is the output of, our, of the gradient descent method. The key things to realize is that it actually lies, these dots on the background are an idea of what the attractor of that system looks like. This is the Aikido map. We have points that actually are consistent with the long-term dynamics because we can take long windows. And the color introduces, uh, introduces the weighting of those points. So we have much more probable, these points are much more likely, and they also happen to be close to the crosshairs, which are true. These points on the side are the results of a large ensemble common filter. And we found repeatedly on smaller, simpler systems that even with 512 points in the gradient descent method and an arbitrarily large number of points, we've tested up to a million in the common filter, we still put much more probability mass near truth using gradient descent. Now, why does that happen? Well, this gives you an idea of why it happens. This is the observation. So what happens in our method is we keep points on the attractor, and if we get an observation, say, which was down here, particularly unusual realization of the noise, the probability distribution on these points would shift to these lower probability regions. But for the ensemble common filter, the entire distribution shifts farther from the attractor, right, when you get these unusual observations. And then it takes quite some time to recover. In fact, it isn't clear that it ever recovers in terms of moving back towards the, 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 the actual manifold of, of the model. So how does it work? Well, what we start out with is a set of observations. These observations are sitting in some high, we've actually, we're starting with a set of analyses for the systems I look at, usually the two are the same. But we're starting out with some initial model states in a fairly high dimensional space. And what we want to find is either a trajectory or perhaps a pseudo orbit, which is close to these observations. So if we were doing four dimensional variation, we start, we take this point, we start wiggling it around, and we get trajectories which flew off. And by wiggling this point, we try to get a trajectory that was close to the entire window. That's exceedingly hard to do, if not impossible. Right? So as a result, variational simulation usually uses very short windows. And that loses information on large-scale dynamics. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to take all of those points. <coughs> so again, these are, this is a time series, of, this is a series of analyses. <clears throat> we're going to make them, we're going to, we're going to put them together into one vector in a higher dimensional space. So U with a pre-superscript is a vector in this sequence space. It's an M by N dimensional space where M is the dimension of our model and N is the number of analyses we've included in a row. So we have all these analyses in one large vector. U with a small subscript, following subscript just denotes one component of this vector. So we start by just putting the observations in. So we have a pseudo orbit. Right? So this is a pseudo orbit. It's just a, it's just a point in this n, n by n space of our, of our model, right? or of any model. So we, we have these points to start with. We don't want to just move this first one. What we're going to do is see where all of them go under our model. So this is the initial analysis, which is mapped to this point, which is, of course, different from the analysis of day minus four. We want to minimize the sum of all of these mismatches. Okay? So our, the gradient descent cost function is just the sum from the beginning of the window to the end of the image, the image of the teeth point minus the t plus first point. 
So you'll notice the observations don't appear. Right? Well, they do appear. They appear as this initial condition. Right? They appear as our initial value for u. And then we simultaneously, ah, yeah, okay. We simultaneously decrease This is going to get hard later when I have about 40 of these in a row. We decrease this mismatch. So our cost function is aiming to move all these points, or this one, this one high dimensional point, we're, we're moving to decrease all these at the same time. Which means we don't have a trajectory at all. We still have a pseudo orbit, but we generate something which is close to an orbit, if there is one, and, it, and, it, and is also close to the observation. We just keep iterating this. Eventually, right, c goes to infinity, we will get an orbit. Whether or not that orbit is close to the observations or not will depend on what the model error is. But if there's no model error, this tends to yield a really good initial point about bu for building a, an ensemble. So here's another example. Let's suppose we have a segment along the Lorenz, along the Lorenz attractor. So this is just four or five observations in a row. Well, we don't really have that. What we really have are a set of observations. From each of those observations, we can run our model forward one analysis time, one assimilation time, right? So these are the observations. And then each time we've missed, if we had a trajectory, this point would actually match this point. This point would match that point. They don't. We want to simultaneously uh, minimize those purple lines. We do that just by doing gradient descent in this larger space. And as a result, we end up with a trajectory. Now, the point here, I mean, you can almost see this, but it's sort of hard to, to say it. We're actually getting information. When we adjust any of these, information is propagating. It's not like going forward and then going backward and then going, it's propagating across in both directions at the same time. Right. We're getting information across local areas of this. As we run the, as we run the algorithm, we collapse down towards a trajectory. That trajectory, well, it turns out to be very close to truth. It's not the truth, right? We don't actually get, we can't, we can't remove the noise completely. But we can work out a trajectory near truth. And it's not only near truth, but it's also close to the manifold. So I've just turned the manifold sideways, right? So it's now you're looking at it like this. The observational noise, of course, perturbs us off the manifold, away from all the trajectories. By doing this gradient descent, we end up collecting a, a trajectory which is on the manifold. OK, so what about these, these questions of large error? Suppose this wasn't my observation, but my observation was somehow down here. If I'm using a sequential method, then this observation is going to cause my, my estimation technique to be pulled, to be pulled aside. Right. When I see the next observation is back up close to the manifold, I'm going to, again, I'm going to, this is going to have to slowly adjust to, re, to recapture the information that I've thrown away. On the other hand, by looking across that point, right, we can minimize both this mismatch and that mismatch by drawing this point in. And that's exactly what happens. What the algorithm does is it just pulls that back in. Okay. So, depending on the audience, it's either obvious that this is not this is nothing like 4D bar, or some, or half of you think that it's exactly 4D bar or weakly constrained 4D bar. Right? It, it's not 4D bar. The reason there, there are several differences. The main difference is that it's actually using a cost function that doesn't involve the that doesn't involve <coughs> the observations at all. The observations are only used to initialize it. It relies on the dynamics of the model, not the statistics of the observations. And that's since it's a geometrical method. The secondly, we make much fewer assumptions about the noise model. And finally, we can take a much longer assimilation window because we're, it's not a shooting technique. And of course, we don't have to invent covariance matrices. Okay. There's, there's, there are no error covariance matrices for the observations. 
And later, compared to weekly constrained 40 var, there's no, there's no model error for covariance matrix. So we've already seen that it doesn't really make sense to describe model error with the covariance matrix. But if you wanted to, right, I guess you could. But, but we don't. I mean, the idea here is we'll try to get information, I'll show you in a minute, we try to get information out about the model error. Using large windows is really very useful. So this is an example from a three-level T21 quasi-geostrophic model. What we've done here is we've used ensemble, we've used windows of length 10, length, length 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 days. So we're simulating over longer and longer windows. What we're plotting here is the distance from truth. And then once we finish the assimilation, we just let the forecast run forward. So as the assimilation gets longer, we see we keep getting smaller and smaller distances from the true point. Once we let the observations go, that, that doesn't have a big effect on the forecast, right? There's something, there's something hard to predict is happening here. That doesn't have a big effect on the forecast after we get about 20 days. But if you compare the assimilation for doing 20 days or longer, we have errors like this, where the 10-day assimilation has much larger errors. And again, that's in part due to the fact that we set the flow up so it looks more coherent. And that's what this picture was at the beginning. So what we're looking at here is not the development in time, but the collapse of an initial state of no gaps, the Navy's operational model at, I think, T72, about. Right? We're looking at how it collapses towards, how it actually collapses towards the pseudo-orbit for our analysis. And what you can see is in the original analysis, we still haven't actually found out if someone bogus this in, but in the original analysis there, there's a, there's a hurricane or there's a big storm that's actually just off the coast of California. This goes away, but you look down here, there's another vorticity area the model actually can support. So the point is, we're looking at, a, again here we're looking at a window of about six days. There's certain things that the model just can't really support, but they're very similar things that are consistent with the model. In the same way, if you look here, there's nothing in the original analysis. And we developed this ridge. So the structures like these are actually consistent, oh, consistent and evolve over the six day period in a way that just taking a six hour snapshot can't really show you. One of the things we'd like to do, and hopefully we will do, is to go back and do this over several periods. They so take several different Julys, take a week, do this analysis and see whether or not the pictures that come out of the longer analysis window actually resemble the relevant synoptic patterns. So what happens when we're noisy? Well, the biggest thing is now the pseudo-orbit, we, we need to account actually for this model error, and the model error is not IID. So we go back and we do the same thing. We're, we're using the same cost function but we're actually looking at more, more phenomena. We, we actually now look at the difference between our observation on the i time step and the model state on the i time step. Right? And we also look at the imperfection error, which is just the difference between the i time step and the image of the previous one. So this is an estimate of the model error, and this is, this is the implied model error, and this is the implied noise. Because when we're doing, when we're doing gradient descent in an imperfect model, we don't really expect the noise to be zero. And we, right, and we, don't, expect the observ we don't expect the imperfection errors to be zero either. So we expect some imperfection error, and we actually expect this point to be some distance from the original observation. We need to know, in that case, when do we stop, right? When do we stop the gradient descent? If the model isn't perfect and we run all the way to a model trajectory, it may take us far away from the observation. And the way we decide how to stop is to just look at how the implied noise and the imperfection error change as we go farther in algorithmic time. As we let this thing get closer to a trajectory, what noise does it imply was in the original observations? Right. And, what, and how big is the actual imperfection error? So the, uh, hopefully, we actually know the lines here, this is, th this is the implied noise level, starts out at zero and goes up. This is the noise level of, this is the real noise level. We don't know what it is. We know it's standard deviation. And this is the implied noise level as we go forward. Once we, once we get noises larger than the implied noise level, or imperfections too small, we actually tend to move away from truth. This is looking at true, the distance from the true state as a function of time. 
Here you see they go down and they slowly start to move back up again. This is for a two-dimensional system. This is for a 40-dimensional Lorentzian 6 system. But since we know this, we can try to find stopping times related to this implied noise. Right? And those so far have given us fairly good results. But it's an open question as to finding a really good stopping time. So we've done this on a number of systems in two dimensions and 18 dimensions for quasi-geostrophic models and for no gaps. We're really interested in looking at other places to do it, to find atmospheric models or even larger models. Because by doing this assimilation, you can actually get an idea of how well the model can track the law of large-scale dynamics and how long the model can track the large-scale dynamics. Not only that, but by looking at these mismatches, remember, so, we, so we run the algorithm, this is for no gaps, we run the algorithm and then we see when we're finished, when we stop, how far away is the image of this point from the next point. And the same way that we looked at those drift vectors at ECMWF, we can actually go back and look at the ve those mismatch vectors for no gaps. And what that gives us is an idea of what the model error actually is. Now this, this, is, this model error is like a control perturbation. This is the perturbation we would have had to give the model to keep it close to the next observation. So these are the perturbations that the model needs in order to fly close to the development of the actual real world. The nice thing about them is they sometimes make sense. So this is specific humidity taken from no gaps with altitude. Right? And what you see is we, we keep needing to insert more moisture at some middle upper level of the, of the model. So the people who run no gaps already knew that was a problem, that their moist convection scheme wasn't getting the, the water in the right place. But we didn't know. The idea here is that the, the assimilation scheme tells you what the current limiting factors, the limiting model errors of your model are. You have to be smart enough then to figure out how to fix them, but it isn't just a question of always increasing resolution. So to conclude, if the model evolves on a natural manifold, then there's this huge, then you can get much better resource allocation as well as dynamical value advantages if you, mod, if you actually initialize on that manifold. You tend to fall onto it otherwise. Inside the perfect model scenario, <clears throat> doing, doing this gradient descent and then using the results uh, as an important sampler gives you really very high quality forecasts. Outside the perfect model scenario, I think all bets are off. I think you really have to try it. It really depends a great deal on the kinds of model errors you have and how good the model actually is. But gradient descent has the advantage that it tells you about the state dependency of model error. You don't actually have to put it in. While various variational simulations requires some sort of statistical description of the model output and the model error as an input. Right? In the same way, the gradient descent is fully nonlinear. Fully non it respects all the nonlinearities of your model. So if your model can follow the data, you can't be led astray by making linear assumptions. And finally, I think this, this question of looking at things in this way by looking at segments of trajectories of the flow, a more geometrical interpretation, when we don't really know the statistics of the error in our model space, can save a lot of statistical arguments. Thank you very much. All right, when we do the gradient. In the gradient descent, the observations come only from, from a given time window. Yes. And in the next time window, the, the previous ensemble is simply forgotten completely. Is that right? So, so OK, so, so there's an operational question and a and, and a practical well, and, a, and a theoretical question. Both, so yes. We, we, we can actually start, when, when we have a new point at the end of the window, we, we can start back with the original analyses and fall all the way down, right? Or we can actually use the information, we, we can use the information from the previous cycle of the gradient descent um, if we want to. So, uh, how, I, I, don't I don't see, I don't how, see what you mean. how do you use the previous info? Because you only, you have an ensemble at the final time for your next time window. You're just going to start from state estimates, uh, which so are obtained. In the same way, when, when we get to the end of the window, this is our trajectory, right? Uh, and we forecast to the white line, right? We, we, have, we have observations scattered about the trajectory, and then the ensemble flares out at the end. We could actually use 
we could actually use those observations and the ensemble as starting points to collapse. I mean, that is another pseudo orbit to collapse down. Alternatively, we can just use the entire we can use the entire window again. Okay, which works better depends a lot on how the model fails. Right? If the model tends to fail catastrophically, like like no gaps has a lot of trouble uh, getting hurricanes at all. <laughs> so if you if it, if it tends to be a catastrophic failure then it probably makes more sense to, to look at the whole window. Whereas if it's just drifting away, then, then using the ensemble's new pseudo orbits and collapsing from there tends to work OK, too. But it really depends on the nature of the model error. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, I had one question uh, regarding the graphs of the implied noise and imperfection error in your slide. Sorry, the, which, which one? The, the graph which you drawn for imperfection error and uh, the implied noise. The one, we have this one. Over here, we have the blue line is the one we are evaluating at each step, right? At each iteration. That's right. So this is taking this is taking one one pseudo orbit on the observations, starting at time equals zero. We measure the implied noise, right, which will be zero at the first step. We measure the imperfection error, the sum of all those little segments, and we actually, in this case, we it's a, it's a toy experiment. We we have we have the actual system, so we can measure the distance from true. As we move forward, the, the, the points move closer to a trajectory. And so the, the apparent, the implied noise, the difference between our points and the, and the actual observations increases. Right? And it actually increases and saturates. And, and then it, right, this, 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 this gets a certain distance from the observations. So, so my point is that the black line, the black level, which are there in the graph, we don't have, do, we, do we know that before, uh, beforehand what those levels really are? In order to stop at that level. Sorry, I can't. I can't quite understand. The, the black line you have in the graph. Right? The black line. So the, the black line in this case is the noise level of the of the noise model. Okay. So we have some idea. We, we don't we don't know what the noise is, but we, we know the statistics of the noise. So this is say the standard deviation of the noise level. All right. So we do have that beforehand. No way to stop. So we, we can use that as a, we can use that as a target. This was our first target, um, but in fact it turns out we work better if we actually go into the noise is a little larger than the expected noise. But do you need the adjoint of that system to for your Sorry, do we need an adjoint? Do you need the adjoint of So yes, so well sorta. Of. So if you have the adjoint, then the gradient descent could be made if you use steepest descent. Right? If you don't have an adjoint, then in fact you can still do the descent, but it's less effective. So we have a paper called uh, Gradient Free Descent uh, with Kevin Judd, I think, is the first author. And in there, we actually do, we, we move along the manifold without having the adjoint. But with the adjoint, it's much faster. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank Lenny for a very nice talk.